did her wonderful project of attempting to find the funds to get all of the wonderful music from Radio Tanzania on to digitalization and make, to make much more available than it is to now. And uh, Rebecca went back to the United States where she's from in Georgia and she has been doing a lot of work that she's going to tell us about. So this is Rebecca Elizabeth Corey. It's called Tanzania Heritage Project. So let's clap for Rebecca. Please. Okay, I hope you guys are all refreshed. Thank you so much, first of all, to Mitch and UDSM for hosting this wonderful conference. I'm so excited to be here. It's really been an honor, a privilege, and an inspiration to hear all of you guys speak. Um, this week and get to get to know some of you a little bit better. Um, so I am here to talk to you today about um, a project called Reviving the Radio Tanzania Dar es Salaam Archives. Um, this is an initiative by the Tanzania Heritage Project, which is a nonprofit that I co-founded with uh, my partner Benson Mukantabula, who's sitting right here. Um, so please come talk to us after the presentation. We'd love to um, share ideas and um, with all of you. So, uh, we founded this nonprofit earlier this year. Um, we've been working on this project since um, early 2010. Um, I, I would like to, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my own personal story of how I came to be involved in this project. Um, not for your entertainment, so much as to help you understand a little bit about the traje trajectory of our project, why I'm involved, and, and kind of as an explanation of our methodology and our approach to preservation and digitization. Um, so I came first as an anthropology student undergraduate in 2007 to study Proverbs. Um, I love Tanzania so much that I came back in 2009 to enroll here at the University of Dar es Salaam in the, um, in the Development Studies program, the Institute of Development Studies. Um, so I was studying here at the university and also working for 2GJ Gay Tanzania, um, which is a microfinance institution. And it was during this trip that I met Benson and we, be we became close friends. Um, unfortunately, uh, after five months, I was in a motorcycle accident that was nearly fatal. And um, thanks to some kind Tanzanians, I survived the accident and I was taken to a hospital, but it was a very close call. Um, in the few weeks I spent in the hospital, I was brought some music from the Radio Tanzania Dar es Salaam collection um, by a friend of mine. And he told me about the archives, the fact that only a very tiny portion of them had ever been digitized. Um, so I, I had to go home to the States to recover, and my recovery took about 18 months. Um, during that time, I was having repeated surgeries, and I was listening to this music and talking to Benson and other Tanzanian friends about Radio Tanzania. Um, so this is all to kind of give you a background um, to understand why we really draw a close link between culture and development. That comes from my time as a student here. Um, the importance of this archive to anthropologists and ethnomusicologists like yourself. That comes from my studies as an undergraduate. And then also just kind of the personal story behind this archive. The fact that at the end of the day, um, I'm involved in this not, it's not preservation for preservation's sake. Um, it's actually about, um, you know, giving, creating access for Tanzanians and music lovers around the world whose lives could really be touched by this music as it touched my, my own life. Um, so, I'd like to just give you a brief background on radio broadcasting in Tanzania um, and how it was used as a tool for human and economic development. Um, so, this quote is from Nyerere, and he said, A country which lacks its own culture is no more than a collection of people without the spirit which makes them a nation. Uh, Nyerere also said that of all the crimes of colonialism, there was none worse than the attempt to make us believe that we had no indigenous culture of our own, or that, or that culture that we did have, that it was worthless. Um, so, pre-independence, you actually heard a little bit about this from Dr. Gunderson um, in his keynote address on the first day of the symposium. Um, radio broadcasting was first used as a, as a method of, of colonial control and as an attempt to prevent the spread of nationalism. Um, the first radio broadcasting began in Tanganyika in 1951. Um, but despite the, the best efforts of the British uh, colonists, um, Tanzanians used music um, as, a, as a form of resistance to colonialism. I've read and heard stories about um, individuals 
hosting um, ngomas and dancey concerts as um, a way to mask political meetings of Tanyu. Um, and then post-independence, the radio station was used for nation building, uh, creating national identity, and as an explicit tool for development. Um, uh, one of Nyerere's most lasting legacies as president was um, the use of Kiswahili as the national language. Um, I, I read that in, in 57 there were over 100 distinct language groups and um, no one language was spoken by more than 15% of the population. Um, but a survey in 67 showed that although there were only 1 million native Swahili speakers in both Tanzania and Kenya, 90% of Tanzanians spoke Swahili as a second language. Um, so that language policy was very successful on the United States part, and um, he used Radio Tanzania, Dar es Salaam, uh, to promote that, that language policy. Um, but uh, for, um, so, so just a, a very brief timeline, um, Tanzania um, became independent in December of 1961, and one of Nyerere's first moves as president of the newly independent Tanganyika um, was to create a ministry of culture and youth. And I think the fact that he did this before anything else showed what importance he placed on culture as a tool for healing from colonialism and, and moving on. The fact that, you know, in order to achieve any sort of um, development in any sense, that, that there had to be a strong, unified national culture. Um, so he saw, he, he believed that as you might justify kind of the state control of the radio of broadcasting in wartime, the war in Tanganyika was against poverty, disease, and illiteracy. Um, so that's how he justified his very strict control of the radio. Um, in 1965, just a year after the army mutiny in Tanzania, um, that's when Radio Tanzania Dar es Salaam was created, uh, the board of directors of um, the Tanganyika Broadcasting Corporation was dissolved and um, RTD fell under the direct control of the Ministry of Information. Um, so Nyerere used radio programming to uh, broadcast language programs, programs about sanitation, um, mosquito elimination, and at the same time um, Nyerere was using uh, parastatal and statal organizations to organize bands under under government organizations and sponsoring them, providing musical instruments, providing rehearsal space, and even salaries to these musicians. Um, and using broadcasting to support other independence movements around the African continent, um, most notably in Rhodesia, Angola, Mozambique, um, and then also to mobilize um, Ugandans against Idi Amin in, in Uganda. So, okay, that's the, the, the fast background, and really I know it's, the afternoon and everyone's a little tired, so what I wanted to do is share what's most exciting to me about this project, which is the archives themselves, and give you kind of a quick virtual tour through the Radio Tanzania archives. Um, this is the outside of the TBC, which the Tanzania Broadcasting Corporation. Um, here's an old poster from the RTD era, um, and just so you know, RTD was um, turned into the TBC in um, 2006. So here's one of the rooms where the reel-to-reel -reel tapes are stored. And just backing up a little bit, these archives um, consist of about 19,000 open reel-to-reel -reel tapes and something in the range of 50,000 vinyl. Um, but we're focusing on the reel-to-reel -reel tapes because that's where most of the unique uh, material is stored because for um, about 25 years after independence, the Radio Tanzania studio was basically the only professional recording studio in the country. Um, so all of the musicians would go to Radio Tanzania to record their music once or twice a year, four or five songs at a time. Um, and then the songs would be played on the radio, um, which would drive people to the live shows and they would collect um, a, a part of the gate fee. So here's one of the rooms. As you can see, it's just floor to ceiling reels. Um, half of them are speeches and the other half is music. The music is divided into Tara, um, Tanzania local bands, Kwaya or choir, um, and what am I missing? Foreign, foreign music. Um, Ngoma. And oh yes, of course, Ngoma. Thank you, Benson. So um, luckily, the the reels are, are stored um, and organized very well. Uh, each box has a number, the date on which it was recorded, the speed at which the reel plays. Um, language, the duration, etc. Uh, so here, this is a photo of one of or of the very first speech in the collection. 
It was recorded on the 10th of August in 1946, which was before the radio station was even established. So um, it must have been put onto this reel from an earlier recording. And it's the late Aga Khan speech uh, recorded when addressing at the weighing against diamond ceremony. Um, just the other day, uh, we were in the archives and I happened to see a uh, Muhammad Ali interview next to two um, Robert Mugabe interviews from 1980 that were recorded at the, um, the airport. So, you know, that's just kind of a taste of the wonders that, that are held in this archive that are really pretty um, amazing and, and should be heard and shared. Um, this is Benson with Bruno Nanguka, who's the head librarian. He's been there since 74. Um, and this, again, just shows some more detail about how the reels are stored and the information that's included with them, including track title, um, the singers on each track, um, and I love this, the Nintendo or dance style associated with each song. Um, so I also, I thought some of you might be interested in this. These are the, there's a card catalog that was put in place by Voice of America in the 70s. Um, so this, we, we really want to digitize this catalog, but I, we feel pretty lucky that, that this much work has already been done for us. Um, so Benson has nicely labeled kind of the different um, features of this card, including the name of the band, uh, the master tape number, track duration, etc. This is a speech card, a sample of an Ngoma card, so it's the style of Ngoma, date recorded, um, location recorded. So, like I said, when I first came to Tanzania, I was studying Proverbs, but this is actually not one I collected, it's one Benson taught me, and it's Kitunze Kidumu, um, which translates to, if you take care of something, it will last. So, um, I, I probably don't need to explain to this crowd, it's probably preaching to the choir just how valuable um, all this material is, but like I said, it's um, Nyerere issued a cultural preservation mandate. Um, because in 73, Radio Tanzania decided that all of the music broadcast on their Swahili service should be Tanzanian music. So they banned foreign broadcasting. Um, and they, I think they somewhat loosened the rule at some point, in it, but it had to be, it could only be played upon request. So anyway, they had a lot of airtime to fill up. Um, so that's why Nyerere sent out recording safaris um, around Tanzania to collect Ngoma um, and also contemporary bands. Uh, these are some photos from the personal collection of John Katime, who's um, a musician here in Tanzania. So I want to tell you a little bit about what the Tanzania Heritage Project has done so far. Um, you know, we, and then I'll go a little bit into our methodology and then the theory behind that. So, you know, because uh, we are, we're relative newcomers to the scene, I kind of told you why, like my personal story of how I became involved, but, you know, we knew that we couldn't just knock on the door of you know, the U.S. Embassy and ask for a $100,000 grant, which is what you need to digitize a full collection like this. So we decided to make this, and, and, and also we did it this way because we wanted this to be a truly community project. Um, and so we, we turned to Kickstarter, which is a crowdfunding platform based in the United States. And from friends, family, and then just people who heard about our project, we managed to raise $17,000 to get to get the project going. Um, you know, we're, we're relatively young and into social media, so we use Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. Um, and, and to be honest, I think that it's important that this community takes advantage of, you know, of these, these tools um, that, have, that have occurred because of the social media revolution. We've also been working very hard at establishing partnerships across a broad range of um, public, private, and civil society organizations. Um, obviously, the TBC, um, Art in Tanzania is a nonprofit that works here in, in Tanzania. Um, Kosota, the Copyright Society, um, the Basata, the National Arts Council, um, Google, and um, Mitch here at, the, at UDSM, and, and hopefully others among you will be interesting, interested in joining this coalition of support for this project. Um, so, from the kind of putting on the anthrop apologist hat, uh, you know, why, why is this important? Why is the link between the past and the present important? Um, the, the literature tells us that when you, when you look, uh, when you reminisce about the past, you're not just recollecting past events or past moments, you're reconstructing that past and at the same time kind of creating a meta-commentary on the present. Um, you know, how can we know where we're going or where we are right now if we, if we don't have this continuity from, from our culture? Um, so John Katime and King Kiki are two of the people pictured here. Um, we're lucky that they're still performing, but you know uh, we don't know how, that it won't be forever. And and 
um, once they're no longer performing around Dar es Salaam, um, it's very important that this music um, that's contained in the Radio Tanzania archives is, is still accessible. Um, Leo Mkania, I put him up here because he is the son of Henry Mkania, who, I, who played for GDC Mlimani Park for many years, and then also the Army, Army Jazz Band. Um, he grew up around the likes of Remy Ongala and um, Michael Ina, and so he's one of the few younger contemporary musicians that I've managed to find that really you can, you can hear the influence of this older generation in his music. Um, you know, Bongo Flava, as, as interesting as, as it is as a commentary on urban music and experience, um, you know, I, I kind of imagine what my life would be like, you know, in the States, not being able to hear the music of my parents' generation, the Beatles, Jimi Hendrix, all of that, and, you know, I, I really, I can't imagine that some of the best music that I listen to now would have ever been created if they hadn't had access to the music from, from past generations. Um, so, again, you know, who is this project for and what's it about? What's it about? Um, when, I, when I thought about approaching the academic community, I was a little nervous because I thought, okay, like I want, to, I want this to be all about access and all about the community, and um, I was worried that you know, scholars and ethnomusicologists and archivists might be more focused on the research aspect of things. Um, but you know, then as I really got into all the research and found out that there is this big trend and direction toward applied ethnomusicology and equitable ethnomusicology. And so I thought, hey, that's great. You know, I, you know it's, I was kind of coming into this at the perfect time. Um, and you know, another thing in our, our methodology, so to speak, of what we've been doing is when I was here for six weeks in January and February, we were not talking just to ethnomusicologists, but also just to any musician we could find, any Tanzanian that we could find, and asking them about this music. And we were so surprised to find that people still love these old Zili Pendua songs. They still listen to them. They still go to these shows. Um, and you know, I can't tell you how many times it's happened that I've had some of the music on my phone and um, and been playing it. And you know, people get so excited about it. People of all generations. And just when we tell them about the project, they, they, you know, they say, you know, we, we really can't, can't wait to have access to this music again. So um, these are just some, sorry, how am I doing on time? Two minutes, please. Okay. Um, so these are just some quotes that show that uh, this, I don't know if it's new, but the, making that link between culture and development, it's been happening in Tanzania for a long time. Um, Yerere said it in 64. Um, Godwin Kaduma said it in 71. Um, and, and it seems that some of the major kind of funding branches and, and institutional people are finally kind of catching on to that. Um, so, you know, it, important in this conversation is the words that we used to talk about it. Are we saving an archive or, or are we reviving it? Um, is this an archive of physical artifacts or the repertoire of embodied memory um, in, in the transmission of this cultural, cultural heritage? Um, and then, you know, are we going to take an activist approach or an academic approach? You've clearly kind of seen where, where I lean toward, but I, I don't want to discount the, val the scholarly value of this collection whatsoever. Um, but I think obviously these things aren't actually a binary, they exist on a continuum, and it's important that we have a discussion about where on this continuum we fall. Um, so, a Zimbabwean proverb, I like proverbs, says, if you can speak, you can sing, if you can stand, you can dance. Um, you know, this music is really wonderful. It unites people um, across all, all, you know, all cultures and all nations. Um, and so I just, you know, I, I really hope that you guys will, you know, join this conversation with me. Um, you know, I, I really want to know kind of your critical feedback, your ideas. Um, and yeah, just thank you very much.